Naimbaga malemi yung amin, in Ilocano, mayong hapon in Cebuano, and magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Anyway, I'm Romel Dela Cruz, and I'm from Hilo, Hawaii. Uh, born and raised in the Philippines up to my ninth year, and then my mother and I migrated to Hawaii in 1954 to join my father, who was one of the latest Sakadas or sugar recruits to work in the fields of Hawaii in 1946. I grew up on the island of Hawaii, a big island, in a small plantation town called Pa'awilo. And there was a mill there called Hamakua Sugar Company. And I attended public schools, Pa'awilo and then Honoka. And then I came to California to go to school in Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount. It was known as Loyola in those days. And then uh, when I, uh, when I uh, graduated, I decided I'd go back to the Philippines. I joined the U.S. Peace Corps as a Peace Corps volunteer, and I was assigned in Mindanao. You know, I spoke Ilocano, I was taught Tagalog in Peace Corps, and then they sent me to Mindanao where I couldn't speak Cebuano. <laughs> so uh, I had to learn fast. And then uh, when I came back, uh, you know, I went back to school uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, went to the School of Public Health at the University of Hawaii in Manoa, and I have a master's in public health. And I started working. So in my previous life, I did hospital administration. And one of the be most beautiful experiences that I had was returning 360 degrees to where I grew up and to run that hospital in my hometown where all the Sakaras that I grew up with were coming in into our nursing home. And it was such a pleasure for me to be able to give back to them. So that's who I am. I, I was married to a beautiful Haole lady, or Purao, or Puti, from Michigan. We met in Peace Corps in Mindanao. And she died a year and a half ago. We have two sons, uh, two sons, one living in Vegas and the other one in uh, Atlanta. Uh, so when I retired in 2007, one of my greatest interests was to follow up on the history of the Sakaras. And by the way, Sakara, literally means recruit. And in Hawaii, it became synonym, synonymous with the, the plantation workers who work in the sugarcane fields and the pineapple fields of Hawaii. Okay, so uh, I'd like to start my presentation by giving you a copy of a song. So take one, everybody, because you're gonna learn how to speak Ilocano today, you know. And uh, I'm going to ask my Kayem, my Kaibigan, my Kababayan, Roberto Ragsak, to help me sing. But I think Erwin already knows the song. But this song was composed in 206 to celebrate the uh, anniversary, 100 years anniversary of the Filipinos in Hawaii. Okay, so. Uh, I figure if, I've never done this like this before, but if I do it right, I think I will be done once we're done with this song, because there's a translation of the song on the other side. I tried my best to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, trans translate the song into English so you could understand, you know, what you're singing with me, okay? But, uh, I'm going to play the song in a Hawaiian fashion. So if there's a hula dancer in the house, yeah. yeah, and if you read the word, remember, hula dancing is not the hips. It's the hands that tells the story. So if you can read this other side and you can translate that into a signal and how to, then, then you're actually doing it. But it goes like this. Saritan, the coming of Filipinos, 
จอยฮาวายตับนมวันยูอิตีนนากาปวานังเดกิดีอามาตายูวานามุวางายังมาณีปุลจายพเอร์โตจายฟิลิปินัสนักลายังดัตีนัลลาวังอาตาเอาสิมังลาดาทีคุณาดังอาปาริโสนายปันดาทิพยกยานันดังอาคัมปูนาลีดาทิพยกดังอาสักดาคัสมันดีดาไม่ลิวลิวาที่อินดามอิติตาง่ายอินดาปีนาหน้าวันแกนพัฒเอกก็สังกาเปรกิสตีบยักดามาสาลาเอ็งอาดูยาร์ที่กอร์นัลอักมัลมาเลมอัตุอุกที่ก้าวนัสันเงมดากิดีอามาตายุวานนักมันพามิลยาดาดิดาลาลาบินัยบายเอ็นมาวอร์เดเรนทีพามิลยาเยสกาดามาวอร์เดเรนทีพามิลยาเนสกาดามอิสุนาง่าดาตายูดิตัวยามเมริกาอีตันน่าลังลังตัวอาพัสตูอาคุนาดา now the real value of the song if you you read the translation agmata kapada ng Pilipino my big big mo cut me ทีรามุตมุนโนนารังรังอายเอ็นทิบิอักมุยตันบิ๊กบิ๊กเอ็มนาอุตังมุเคนนิสกาดา Anyway But that's so. If I did a good one, I'm done. I've told you the history of the Filipinos in Hawaii. But that's what is so. I will try to kind of try to follow. I said so. What I said was, let me tell you the story of uh, the Filipinos in Hawaii. The first Filipinos to arrive in Hawaii, documented, was on December 20, 1906. 15. Uh, we're on this boat called the SS Doric, and they landed in Honolulu, 15 of them, and they were all from the Ilocos, in one town in Ilocos Sur called Kandon, 15 of them. And if you will turn to the back of your paper, uh, a statue honoring the Sakaras was sculptured by a good friend of mine, a son of a Sakara, Fred Soriano, from a blue stone. I mean, blue rock, we call it in Hawaii. And we placed it in front of his house in 205. And for a whole year, he carved that stone. And that's what it is. And Pete, some people criticize Fred because how come he's so short? I'm look at you, my friend. How many Filipinos were actually five feet and above? So that, that's the size of that stone. And so we had to put it on a pedestal. <laughs> so when you go to the statue in Keau, it was called Ola'a then. And you will see the names of the first 15 on that, you know. And he's looking down at you, you know, 
to show how proud he is and it's and and we have statue of sakaras like at the filipino community center in waipahu but that guy is six feet tall bronze he's got a high bridge nose not a flat nose like mine you know so that's not a you know that's a you know they well of course the guy looks really imposing but you know i mean that's not a sakara really but anyway, the first, the first 15 were from the Ilocos, but what happened after that is that no one came until 1909. And then uh, for the next 15 years or so, most of the Sakaras that arrived in Hawaii came from the Visayas. Cebu, Bohol, some from Leyte and Negros. The first, about 25,000 arrive uh, between those era. So they were quite established already. And then it was only after 1920, when the rest of the, you know, when the plantations needed more workers, and uh, the Filipino workers started agitating because they realized that the situation wasn't really good for them. They had the lowest paying jobs. So when we look at that second paragraph, what ports did they come from? Most of the earlier Sakaras departed from Manila, from Manila. So they had to go to Manila to, uh, you know, so consequently there were some Tagalogs but, uh, that, that came, but not too many. And, and the question I said, why not? He said, why would the Tagalogs leave the Philippines, right? They had the benefits of the Spaniards and the, and the you know, the American colonizers. So why would they leave? They had the best job, the best education, whereas the guys in the outside of Manila, in the Visayas, and in the Ilocos, where they didn't have the benefits, they were the ones that were willing to come. Okay, so they departed from Manila, but they also departed from Cebu. Directly from Cebu, they would, and, and those ships would go first to Hong Kong, Japan, and then to Honolulu. That's how, you know, it was. So from about 1906 to 1930, most of those, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sakaras, they came, uh, you know, they departed from Manila, but like I said, from Cebu. They did not depart from the Ilocos until after the war, 1946. And that was because Manila was totally devastated. The ships couldn't come in. And the reason why they had to go to the Ilocos was uh, the Tiding Macduff Act said that the Philippines will become independent on July 1, 1946. And so they went directly to the Ilocos to pick them up. And the priority was given to those uh, who had relatives in Hawaii. And since, and, and let me back up a little bit. 125,000 uh, Sakaras came to Hawaii from 1906 to 1946. Of the 125,000, only 10,000 were women and children. So you can see the ratio, 10 to 1 on the average. But in some places like Kohala and the Big Island, very isolated, sometimes it was 50 to 1 or 100 to 1. So when you talk about why was the life of the Sakara so sad? Or he said, you know, sad was the life of the Sakara, coping with loneliness, and they could, you know. When these guys were strapping young men, right? Maybe some of their early teens or early adulthood. And they were being worked out in the fields six days a week, 10 hours a day, dollar a day. So that was their pay. And so, at the end of the day, you know, they raised hell, right? I mean, you, why not? And, you, and so, when there were so few women, uh, there was a common term for, I, I don't know if you've heard, and, and I, I told my friends, maybe I should mention the name. Have you ever heard of the word cowboy, cowboy? Yeah. And what is your understanding of what that yeah, word meant? That's, that's where Women, even if they're married, are very much in demand, even by the husband's good friends. Exactly. It's derived from the word, you know, the word is cowboy, right? Uh, in, in those Western movies. 
you rustle the cattle, right? But when we use the word koboy koboy, it was the wives or the partner or someone else. If the woman was attracted to a certain fellow and maybe she wasn't getting a good life with her current spouse or partner, they would koboy koboy her, kidnap her and run away with her. And, and like Pete says, the woman was really in demand. And I don't know if that happened here on the West Coast. It did. It did. That too. All my friends are from the Union. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that uh, autobiography that was written by Angeles Monrayo about Don Mabalon kind of help. Um, it was a diary of a 12 year old Filipino girl who actually. Uh, uh, started her, her uh, early years in Hawaii. And uh, when uh, sh uh, there was a strike, and I, I'm going to talk about that later on, but uh, she was the only person that I know of in our history, Filipinos, that actually wrote her account of what she saw going on in 1924 in Hawaii when there was the strike. And she, would, she writes in that book that, you know, Mr. Pablo Manlapit, who was the first Filipino leader, well known throughout, yeah, and that's the book right there. And she said, you know, uh, she came today and everybody's, you know, really waiting for him. One of the things she describes was 12 years old girl, she, uh, Saturday night, Friday night, they would have dancing and 10 cents a dance. And she said, tonight I earn $4. Tonight, sometime $10. Now you compare that with what her father made in the plantation, a dollar a day. She's making four or $5 in a night, for one night. But that's, you know, the women, you know, so the women were such in demand, willing to pay for a dance, but we had a little uh, uh, talk about that book, and I was asked to kind of describe uh, uh, the life of uh, the women in Hawaii. And I said, you know, there were kind of three or four different types. Uh, I, I would describe women. One was, you know, when the, Phil the some of the women in, and I don't know here on the West Coast, but in Hawaii, the first one was, they, they had this uh, practice of what they call a pareha, pairing off. So the women couldn't travel with their husband. Americans did not encourage that. Remember, Filipinos were nationals. They could come in and out of the United States. They couldn't vote, they couldn't own land, but they could come to America without any papers because they were Filipino nationals. But in order for the women to come, they would pair them off at the pier. So they called this the pareha pairing off. They would marry them at the port, and once they got to Hawaii, who knows what, aloha, you know, bye-bye. So that was one. And then second was uh, this, this dancing that, you know, women were involved, that, that I just described. Before. The other was the koboy koboy. Uh, you know, the women were such a high commodity that, and Historic people, some people who are ultra conservative, they will say, you know, that's really, we don't, let's not talk about that. But I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna judge. I think it was our way of surviving. And a lot of, you know, uh, you know, my friends, you know, came from that kind of, life. and the fourth type was, I said, you know, I always used to wonder, like some of my classmates in, in class, they all look different. They had different appearance. Some, and, and, and I, I, the other way I, I describe that is that they had to cope. And so they shared women. And so that's why they, the kids had different fathers. But I always wonder, how come the men always hanging around that family? They supported each other. It was a mode of survival. And, and, and like I said, 
it you know allowed us to survive in Hawaii besides marrying outside of our racial uh, you know mainly Hawaiians and Portuguese women in Hawaii that is very common but I also say that maybe if the husband and wife just stayed together and raised their kids maybe some of the leaders that we had in in Hawaii would not have evolved or, or come about. A classic example is Ben Cayetano. Ben Cayetano came from a broken marriage. His mother uh, left the father for another man. And, and ben, in his, ben Cayetano in his book describes how his aunt introduced him to his dad. Uh, they were at a cockfight and they were looking down on the ground floor and the aunt calls, hey, come here, boy. You know, that's your father down there. That's how Ben was introduced to his dad. And his father, that he actually identified as his dad, as, uh, as an Ilocano man from Pangasinan. But the his real dad, you know, he never, this man raised him. Until the day that that man died, Ben Caetano, you know, to care of him at his house, even when he was governor. Yeah. So that's the story of, of how we survive in Hawaii. And I, I imagine here too that, you know, uh, the uh, pareha, the, the social box dancing, or the, we call that Hawaii manso or goofo broke, you know, because these men would go dancing and they would spend their money to dance if they were attracted to a certain woman, they would, you know, pay money. Or even, and then later on, that's part of the program is they would, you know, bake a cake, roast a chicken, and, and they would, you know, bid. And if you were attracted to a 14, 15 year old Filipino girl, you would try to buy her baked good, right? So that's, that, that's one way, you know? So anyway, that's kind of the story of the, uh, you know, how we live, uh, you know, and how we survive. In, in Hawaii, uh, and and I say it was a, a way that that the Filipino people survived. They, they they took care of each other. They, even the men who probably fathered a child outside, you know, with all the other kids, they supported. They were there, and I used to wonder why would you have so, so, as many as twenty five godparents, ninong or ninang, but that was another way of extending that that family, uh, you know, uh, interrelationship. And uh, so that way, it was. so if you ask me, besides the socializing part, what is it that contributed, Filipinos contributed to Hawaii, to a society in Hawaii? The only thing that we brought to Hawaii was our ability to work, the labor. And from, from the time that the Filipinos arrived in Hawaii, uh, uh, they were always assigned the lowest paying jobs. Uh, and it was the practice of the sugar plantations that, uh, you know, when they brought the Chinese first, and the Chinese really didn't like to work in the fields, and so they brought in the Japanese, 1860s, uh, 70s, and the Japanese, when they realized that they weren't getting a break either, they brought the Portuguese and the Puerto Ricans. And for some, I, I don't know, they even brought black Americans from Alabama. There's a camp on the island of Maui called Alabama Camp, where the, <laughs> the, the blacks settled there. But when they were, you know, they exhaust all that, who did they bring last? And I, if you ask me, why did America go to the Philippines and occupied the Philippines and bought it for $20 million and then annexed it at the same time as Hawaii was annexed in 1898, by the way. The same time that Philippines became a part of the United States, it's the same time that Hawaii became also, uh, not as a, you know, uh, colony, but you know, as a part of the, as a territory. So the, for a long, long time, Hawaii was called the territory of Hawaii. Uh, anyway, so 
as I said earlier, the first Filipinos to, to be brought as Sakaras was in 1906. But you should also know that there were Filipinos that were trickling in to Hawaii even before then. And uh, uh, there are recorded uh, uh, in the census. And Hawaii was a monarchy at first, as a kingdom. And then it became... Uh, a republic when the queen was overthrown in 1893 it became a republic and then in 1898 becomes a colony when Hawaii was annexed by the United States and the Philippines became a colony in the Treaty of Paris in 19, 1898 so but there were Filipinos in the territory and I should mention among the most famous one and and for you who may know Hawaiian history is uh, want to know Hawaiian history is there was this gentleman but I came by the name of Jose Libonio and he was on his way to San Francisco with a bunch of friends and they stopped in Honolulu he was a musician and he jumped ship and he was recruited to be a member of the Royal Hawaiian Band and uh, in 1893 when the Queen was overthrown uh, the band disbanded and the uh, Republic band, which was supportive of the, uh, the newly established Republic, established by none other than by Sanford B. Dole, Dole Pineapple. You know, so, <laughs> so but the other guys, this renegade band, they, they asked Jose Liborno to lead them to the, for this, re, you know, rebel band or whatever. And one of the famous things, the connection between the Hawaiians and the Filipinos is Jose Liborno. There's a song in Hawaii which is only sung, never danced to. It's called Kaulana Napua, a stone eating song. And uh, the stone eating song, was, the lyrics was composed by this lady named Eleanor Pendergast. But the music to it was composed by this Jose Liborno. You can Google it, Jose Liborno brings this renegade band to America, to Hawaii, to the mainland. And they play this song, Kalala Napua. And one of the most important phrases in that song is that we would rather be eating stones than sign that paper that the white man wants us to sign to give our land away. And to think that our countrymen composed music to that song. So he went all over the West Coast to D.C. and tried to restore the Queen. But it did not happen. And so he was a persona non grata in Hawaii. So he, he had to stay here. And you know what? He ends up in Peru. And he writes the national anthem for Peru. He's buried in Peru. And he has his two family in Manila and family in Peru. But Jose Liborno, Google it, you'll find it. But anyway, instead, going back to the labor thing, uh, this guy Pablo Manlapit arrives in 1910, and then one of the reasons why I got interested in really following up the story is he was from Batangas, this guy, Pablo Manlapit. He arrives in Hawaii, it's assigned to my hometown of Pawilo. 1910 and he marries a white woman barely five feet but supposedly this this lady was much taller than him he starts agitating 1915 he leaves Paolo goes to Honolulu apprentice himself to a lawyer and he claims to be the first Filipino to be ever licensed to practice law he never went to school or to law school or anything but he becomes a lawyer so he, he actually left the plantation because he, he tried to agitate and, 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 and campaign for more you know, uh, uh, benefits for the workers, but he couldn't. Uh, and so he moves to Honolulu. And uh, the Japanese who were already active in, before uh, nine, the 1900s, actually they they conducted a, a big strike in 1910. They gained nothing. But the Filipinos were becoming a potent force in the labor force in the plantation. So, uh, and, and they approached uh, Manlapit. Why don't we 
combine our forces together in 1920. And so let me, did that thing appear in this? Where's Terry? Okay, 1920 strike, if you look at the ball there. The 1920 strike, we're talking a lot of the strikes that took place here in California were all single ethnic, right? The Filipinos just walk out. So the first multi-ethnic strike that happens in uh, the country and in Hawaii is in 1920. The 1920 strike. And Pablo Manlapit, but, but typical, I think, of our people is, you know, they walk out first. They conducted the strike first, and the Japanese are going to stand on the side and watch Pablo Manlapit, you know, and then you see all these things. There's, there's something about some corruption, supposedly, to, that the, the plantation tried to accuse Manlapit of taking bribery, therefore, you know, that he pulled back the strike. But then they finally joined together again. And so that was the first, uh, you know, uh, uh, multi-ethnic strike. I mean, it happened in 1920, and, but they gained nothing. They, they actually, they demanded higher pay. If you will read, you know, it, it's very hard to look at it from here, but, but, but yeah, so these were some of their demands. Uh, eight hour workday, insurance fund for injured and aging workers, paid members, leave, wage increase from 77 cents to 125 a day. <laughs> you know, and, and, and some higher pay for women. But like I said, it, and it, 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 they gained nothing. So that was in 1920. And uh, so after that, what happened is that because of that strike, I think the plantation realized that, you know, uh, they better bring more workers. So that's when the Ilocanos really came in its time. And most of the, uh, like I said, because of the, the early Sakaras came mainly from the south, and regionalism was still very strong among us, right? We couldn't even speak to each other. <laughs> the Carlos couldn't speak to the Visayan. In fact, one of the big jokes about Manlapid is that he spoke only Tagalog. He had to have the Ilocano translators on one side <laughs> and the same one was on the other side when he gave a speech. You know, he would stand on a box, supposedly, and <laughs> they would translate for him what he was saying. But, uh, so that's, that's what happened. And then, uh, so the next strike, uh, okay. This is the 1924. Then down arrow. Keep doing it until the page comes up. Oh, okay, okay. 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 1924 strike. So the result of the 1920 strike is that from then on, the Japanese got all the better jobs. We were brought in to cut sugarcane. That was our job, and that was the most labor-intensive work that you could do in the plantation. What they did was uh, they would chop cane and then pile them up, and the guys had to carry them 20, 80 pounds on their back to a collecting bin or in, on the big island, they, they, the plantation built mas massive flumes with water running. So they would pile the, the cane on the flume, which would float down to a collection point. Uh, so that was our job. Like on my, my, my uh, hometown, I understand they may have had about 1,500 to 2,000 cane workers, you know, because that was how they, remember, there's no, mech Hardly any mechanization yet at that point. We were brought in with our cane knives to chop the cane. That, that was, and while the other racial groups, the Portuguese and the uh, Japanese had the, the trade work, we were still, you know, we were there. And that was really our job till the very end, by the way, you know. So 1924 comes along, Pablo Laman Lapid, you know, teaming up with some some other organizers, but main, I think it was a guy, a white guy, and, and he calls a strike in 1924. First on Oahu, Maui, Hawaii, and then Kauai. And this is where the bloodiest confrontation takes place in Kauai. Uh, 
mainly, maybe no more than a hundred Visayans were holed up in a warehouse. And remember the practice of, of the plantations to bring strike breakers. They brought the Ilocanos to break the strike. So, and some of my uncles, three of my uncles, ends up in Kauai. They're working over there in the tw early 1920s. And it just so, and, and Kauai was the last island that held this strike in 1924. It started in Oahu, then Maui, and then the big island, which was the most successful. They had the greatest turnout of strikers, but the, the plantation did not capitulate at all. And so, Toward the tail end, I think of the summer of 1924, this uh, hundred or so mainly Visayan workers, in fact, they were all Visayans, I think, they were holed up in this warehouse. And these two Ilocano boys just arrived. They were going to go to the plantation store to buy, to buy shoes. So they are kidnapped by the Visayan strikers, taken into their camp. And so the Ilocanos went to the sheriff and says, you know, they're holding up our brothers out there. So the sheriff, with some deputized, uh, I would say, pig hunters. They had guns. And they went to try to retrieve the two Ilocano boys that were being held in the camp. Meanwhile, the deputized uh, uh, so-called policemen s surrounded the camp. And while they were escorting the two uh, Ilocano boys out of the camp, shots rang out. And in the end, 17 were killed. And if you hear a lot of our really activists, uh, they try to, you know, they make it like it was a total labor collective. There was no collective bargaining yet. So, and there was no contract to enforce. So a lot of these strikes like here were kind of wildcat strike, right? People just walk out. This is the same thing. So these two guys are walking out and shot right out. Four policemen were, were killed and 16 Filipinos. So you can see, so when you hear people talk about the labor movement in Hawaii, they always refer to the 1924 strike as the Hanapepe massacre. It occurred in the town in Kauai called Hanapepe. So Hanapepe massacre. Oh, the, the whole territory was, was concerned. They sent the National Guard, they thought the Filipinos were going to revolt, you know, and if, so you see the picture of, uh, I think, them lying against the wall there, and this guy with this World War II uniform kind of uh, guiding them, and this is Pablo Manlapit, by the way, that's Pablo right there, and uh, he, uh, but he wasn't even there in, in Kauai, he was on Oahu. But they blame him, of course, because he was, he was the front man for it. And uh, till today, I mean, latest day, nobody wants to talk about it. I mean, and in fact, there was a project that you guys must, there must some coverage. There was this girl in, in Kauai, uh, her name is Stephanie Castillo, and she was responsible for producing that video on the untold story about the first and second regiment that went to the Philippines. Well, Stephanie was a good videographer. And she tried to, to get some money to try to reincarnate the, uh, the, the 24 strike. In fact, a lot of people say, we, we don't know where they are buried, actually, the, 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 the 16. But I have, in my longer presentation, if you were interested, we can look at it later on. Actually, the coffins were on a truck. And don't tell me we don't know where they were buried. Because I think, and they knew, and so they were having all this kind of metal machine tried to, but that's to drum up interest for everybody so we could donate money so we could, she could produce this longer version of Puma. But the end result is that, you know, Manlapit is blamed for the whole thing. So the plantation trump up charges against him. Not for the strike, but for a situation that occurred on the island of Oahu, where he was accused of actually uh, instructing this person who thought he got poor medical treatment at one of the, the medical plantations. And that's how they 
convicted him. And they deported him to California. He was here between 1927 to 1932. And I imagine that he must have run in with It Leon somewhere here in California. Because he was, he was in Stockton, he was in Watsonville, according. But nobody here ever tried to trace whether he actually was trying to compete with Italy in trying to organize. Now remember, this was before all these strikes are happening here. We've already had two strikes. So he's, he's deported to California. He spent five years here. But I have not read of anything that was written about what he was doing here. Uh, but he was here. But in 1932, he comes back to Hawaii. And right away, he, you know, he starts organizing again. So, uh, another strike happened. This, remember now, this is all Filipino. All the other racial groups are watching us. They say, let those Filipinos go ahead, man. We're, you know, th but they're not, you know. Yes, Pete. Can you take a question now? Or yeah, later? maybe later. Let, let's go through there. And I've just covered the, all the other. So, Another strike, 1937, Pablo Manlapit has a few lieutenants, they're organizing. But this time, the plantation got him again. This time they deported him to the Philippines, never to come back again. But a strike takes place on the island of Maui. And would you believe it, you know what that strike was called? A Luz Viminda strike. Luzon, Mindanao, Visaya. All the uh, different regional groups now are going to combine, but only on the island of Maui. And so, uh, against, you know, uh, uh, Alexander Baldwin is the most prominent, uh, you know, uh, uh, plantation owner on the island of Maui. But believe it or not, with the help of the ILWU, they conduct a strike that was the most successful of all. No collective bargaining, but they got raises. So in so far as recorded history, they did succeed in getting something. One of the stories that I, I interviewed this, or I listened to his stories, this man, uh, Carlos Damaso, Carl Damaso, he was an organizer on the island of Maui. And what he said, one of the things that they did was uh, he gathered all the cane cutters in the fields one day, about 2,000 of them, with their cane knives. And they, he told them to sharpen their knives. And you made 2,000 knives, you know, like that, with the knives sharpening. They must have thought these Filipinos were going to go on a rampage, right? But that, can you imagine that? It, it did them. But the reason why that, that, that strike succeeded in some way, I think is because with the assistance of the ILWU, Harry Bridges came to Hawaii, Jack Hall, who stayed permanently to lead the ILWU for a long while. Uh, they told all the different ethnic groups after that, is that if you want to succeed, there is only one way you can do it. You're going to have to tell your story as a group and, and not do it, not conduct a strike because you're Filipino or you're Japanese, but you do it for economic reasons, you know, higher wages, better living conditions. And they listened to that later on. But after that 37 strike, like I said, Manlapit is gone. He's sent to Mindanao, never to come back to America again or to Hawaii. Uh, so the war comes, 1941. The LW is very, very uh, concerned. Uh, you know, in fact, if I was looking at the first and second uh, infantry here, you know, there was supposed to be a third regiment composed primarily of Filipino workers in the plantation in Hawaii. That would have been the third regiment. But my understanding is that it was never established because the plantation knew that if the Filipinos in Hawaii would form a third regiment, what would happen to the plantations? They were, what they were working in the fields, right? So that's why the 3rd Regiment was never formed. So that's why the Hawaii boys came here to join up with the 1st and 2nd Regiment. 
Otherwise, we would have stayed in Hawaii and we would have our third. But do you know how they pacified the Filipinos in Hawaii during the war? They formed units called Hawaii Rifles. They would march around on weekends and with wooden guns. And they would tell them, oh, you know, Japanese are coming, so you got to go by, by, by the landing over there. And just in case the Japanese attack, they would guard. But that's how they kept them to work in the fields, at the same time thinking that they were doing the country a favor by, by uh, you know. But, but meanwhile, the ILW has sent forces from the West Coast to talk to all the plantation workers who were in the field. They, of course, the Japanese are gone, right? They're fighting the war in Europe. Uh, they either that or they're in the internment camps. But, uh, you know, the ILW is organizing and with the, the Japanese boys in Hawaii, they, they, they really organized them during the war. And when the war was over, 1945, the first collective bargaining contract was, uh, you know, was, uh, was put into place. And I always make this point. Uh, you know, the Wagner law that established collective bargaining was a federal law. It did not allow for agriculture workers. It was only trade people that belonged to, you know, to the unions. In Hawaii, in order to establish collective bargaining for cane cutters and agriculture workers, we, the legislature, established or passed a law called the Little Wagner Act, which allowed us to establish collective bargaining rights for, for agriculture. So in 1945, that was the first time that agriculture workers were allowed to organize as unions and have collective bargaining. But the seminal point in Hawaiian history is uh, July 1, 1946, Philippines would become an independent country and you could not bring any more, you know, saccades to America, but because of the tithing MacDuff's act that there was a clause in there that the plantation could exercise to bring Filipino workers one more time in anticipation of a strike that was going to be called on September 1, 1946. So from January on to May 1946, America, I mean the plantation were rushed to the Philippines, this time not to Manila, but directly to the Ilocos. And on, on this ship called the USS Manawili, which was a, a cattle ship that brought cattle between the island, they converted that into a transport ship. So there were four voyages of 1,500 each of those ships that they were going to bring to Hawaii to break and strike that was called, was to be called on September 1, 1946. My father was on the third voyage to the Manawili, and he tells me that on the ship, they were already being recruited and signed as members of the ILWU before they got off the ship. So when the 6,000 arrived at the end of May, uh, they, they started working. But when January, I mean September 1, 1946 took place, the whole islands of Hawaii was paralyzed totally, except one plantation decided they, they couldn't get a vote to walk out. So, but all the plantations in, in Hawaii struck. 30,000 workers, 70% to 60% were Filipinos. They all walk out, including my, pa my father and all the 6,000 that were. And that, the, that strike lasted for 90 days. You see those, those guys arriving with the tags and, and you know, the walking down and, and so, September 1, 1946, I think it was November when the strike was called, but can you imagine we were running out of rice in the territory <laughs> and uh, they were panicking so the, the Union tried to get some rice to Hawaii and they ordered some brown rice. Filipinos don't eat brown rice. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was a big... And so whenever... The, I think it was... Who was it? Was you talking about the 100 pound sack rice? Whenever there was talk of strikes, my God, this 100 pound bag rice after 1946 was... Uh, man, you, 
I remember we had one strike when I was uh, in 1958, and we had three bags of 100-pound rice in our, in our house, just in case it did happen again. But September 1 to November, 90 days of a strike. That was the changing point in America, I mean, uh, history in Hawaii. Because of that strike, uh, the ILW becomes a political force in the state of Hawaii, in not the state yet, we're just a territory. And thank you, thank you, Erwin. Uh, you know, in 1954, when I, I arrived, my mother and I arrived in Hawaii, I think the early part of November 54, the election was held before that, and you know who got elected? The Democrats overthrew the Republican, uh, uh, you know, uh, political force in Hawaii, Daniel Inouye, Betsy Mink, Spark Matsunaga, Jock Burns becomes governor. Hawaii becomes a state. And Hawaii becomes a leader force in, in, in collective bargaining contracts. One of the most important laws that I think when people want to talk about health in this country is Hawaii because of health was very important. That's a negotiated thing. In Hawaii, if you want to work, you want to establish a business, 20 employees or more, you have to, have, you have to provide medical insurance for your employees. That's why a lot of people don't want to come to businessmen. They don't want to come to Hawaii because that's one of the collective bargaining. The other thing is, you know, unemployment insurance, all that kind of stuff. All those changes, and of course, the leadership by by Daniel Inouye in particular in in changing the laws of this country. And when we sing that song in 1965, that was one of the the most important thing that I think he championed was changing the laws to allow more Asians and Filipinos in particular to come to this country as professionals or to reunify families. You know, the, the, uh, the, the wives and daughters and children of Sakaras and, and even here, they were all allowed now to reunite. And, and our quota in, in bringing people from the Philippines and all over Asia went up. And so the rest is history. There was one more strike that in particular that I should mention. It was 1958, which I remember. You know what we call that strike in Hawaii? It become, became the Aloha strike. Both sides were nice to each other. They knew, they realized that in order for the industry to survive, we had to get along. So they allowed certain workers to go and water their sugarcane fields rather than stopping it totally. Uh, and it, you know, when, when the strike took place in 1946, there were really no actual Filipino leaders in the movement. And I always tell people, you know, that strike could not have survived without the Filipinos. What if we did not work out, walk out along with everybody else? Do you think America or, or Hawaii would be what it is today? I don't think so. Although we were not in leadership position, it was our capacity, our numbers that allowed for the strike to succeed. And it was only in the 1990s when the ILW finally realized that, that the Filipinos were ready to lead the union. And for the, since 1990, all the president of the local 142, uh, you know, were Filipino kids, including the, the current one right now, it's a female. She's head of the ILW, Local 142 here, and her last name is Domingo. Of course, sugar is dead. The last sugar plantation to close was in December of 9, 2016. That was it. Sugar is dead. Uh, we no longer have, you know, sugar growing. And, you know, we build the industry and we close it. The, guy, the last... The, the majority of the employees that were employed at HCS, Hawaii Commercial Sugar, and the other Mar were Filipinos. In my hometown of Hamakua, and we closed it in 1994, the same thing. It was us. It was us that really brought pineapple and sugar to the levels where the, the state of Hawaii prospered, and it's all gone. And one of the most poignant stories that I share with people is that my friend, 
uh, you know, uh, Eusebio La Pena, Bobo La Pena. He is the son of a cane cutter. Uh, grew up from the ranks from cutting cane and spreading poison on the weeds. He became president, head of the ILWU, in, uh, and he was the uh, head of the union in 1995. And I had the pleasure of introduce, interviewing him to record his story. And one of the questions that I asked him was, how did it feel to be on the negotiating table closing the industry that brought us Filipinos to be where we are and you're negotiating the closure and sitting with the plantation uh, managers and the big HCS and tears rolling is such as that I couldn't do anything you know he said we were the victims of our own success we were the highest paid sugar workers in the world we were the most efficient the per capita production of sugar was the highest among Hawaii. We just work ourselves out of a job. We outprice us. You know, we were, we could no longer compete. And this sugar plantation, you know what they were doing? They were in Negros, they were, they had their sugar plantation. They, they were already there. So sugar is dead. The ILW is now running hotels instead. That's where a lot of the workers transition into the hotel industry. And so that's where most of the, you know, ILW is organizing. You know, there's only two unions, the uh, hotel workers and then ILW. They divide up the, the hotels in, in the state of Hawaii. So that's, that's where it's at. Uh, so are we done, Erwin? 2.30, 1.30. But open for question. Yeah, sure, sure. If you have a question, yes. I couldn't help but thinking of the parallels as you you were mentioning that sugar is dead. Yeah. And I was there in Maui, and my cousin showed me some of the empty fields that once were thriving. And but I couldn't help but think about our own Delta asparagus. Mm -hmm. Asparagus is dead mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Asparagus, which, as we all know, many of our <clears throat> Manons labored in asparagus fields for years. And like in Hawaii, asparagus is dead here because the markets are now in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So I was also told that, and I don't know how true this is, and I'm going to ask you this question, but my cousin had. Uh, had said that many of the former employees that used to work on the sugar plantation really preferred to work on the resorts now because the jobs were cleaner, paid better. And so, you know, they welcomed the industry of, of uh, you know, resort and tourism, which as you say, they became their own victims. Yeah. So I just wanted to and hear a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, being in hospital administration, I ended up, you know, I went back to my hometown where we have a hospital, mainly nursing home. And these guys, they, they became employees of the hospital. And it was a hard transition, I tell you. How can you be a diesel mechanic now you're wiping people's behind as nurses age? Guys now, it was hard for them. It was very hard. But uh, yeah, the hotel industry, but it also changed the whole social dynamics of Filipinos. The wives now could work. They end up in the plantation. You can see the social dynamic that took place. They're no longer at home taking care of the kids. And so there's a lot of changes, there. a lot of divorces, break up of marriages because they got to meet tourists from the mainland. <laughs> yeah, just to yes, sir. Back to your earlier question, uh, point. I just wondered because, uh, thank you. Uh, my, my father came here from uh, a local, Sanai local. So yes. In the 19, between the 1910s and 20s. And uh, I didn't understand. I wish I did, but uh, he had to, to work in, in Hawaii, in, uh, I guess, in plantations before he could come here. But what was it like for the Filipinos in the north? You said it wasn't very organized in terms of getting from the north to Manila to get 
get a ship over here. Well, can you expound on that just a little bit for me? Yeah, so yeah well, like I said, I was born in the Philippines. You know, you spoke your own language there. And uh, if you're far from Manila, the benefits of education and, and, and culture out in the province, they didn't care about that. So most of the benefits took place in and around Manila. And so who got educated the most, who got the benefit of, 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 of it was those who live nearby. Look at all the, most of the sailors that left uh, and joined the Navy. They're not from the Ilocos. Most of them are from our Cavite, Olongapo, that area. So that, that's what I'm saying. That's what I meant. And, and can you imagine, this is, this is the other dynamic, is that it took them to come to Hawaii for a visa and any Lucano to Gaalab funny to meet. They didn't go traveling, you know, to each other's region. They came to Hawaii and they couldn't speak to all each other, so they formed Pigeon English. You know? And so that's why that strike in 24, it was, if you ask me, what do you think it was? Because it, it was, I think the regionalism was still pretty strong at that time. And so nobody wanted to talk about that massacre because it was among Filipinos, right? So we, we didn't want to talk about it. No, they, did, they didn't want to talk. There was a sense of shame, I think, why we didn't want to talk about it. Yes, please. First of all, thank you for being here. I think your presentation has been really great. And uh, I have one comment and one question. My comment uh, has to do with your saying, uh, you're, you're talking about Filipinos being brought to this country for labor. Mm -hmm. Actually, Filipinos coming here, just as a long history of, of America, people of color, if you think about it, the only people of color until 1964 were, were brought here. It was mm -hmm. starting obviously with the blacks. Mm -hmm. And, and and you mentioned the Asian uh, population came there, the Mexicans, all of them, all of these people of color were brought here for labor. And I don't think a lot of people think about that, uh, but it is really true. Just look at your history. That's my comment. My question has to do with uh, Ana Pepe. Mm -hmm. It seems to me about a year ago that uh, they had all this publicity about finding the gravesite. Yes, yes right? that's right. Uh, but you know, after finding that, there was a lot of excitement about it. I don't know what really happened. I don't even know if they were able to identify the 17 dead. Uh, but I'm, I'm really curious about that. And just as an aside, uh, my father was one of those that was black ball, and that's how he came to California. Yeah, yeah. But my question really is about what happened to the Hanapepe mur murders? Well, what, what happened now? Bottom line right now is Stephanie Castillo, who was the prime researcher for that project, died in March. Yes. And so I don't know if someone will take up the cause and I don't know what's going to happen, but I think we know where they are buried. I think people know. And, and, and the story about how we, the confrontation, I think we need to talk about it in an open and accept that, yeah, maybe we were at some way at fault too. In, and remember, there was really no union contract that was busted. It was, you know, uh, it was uh, between the plantation and these workers too. There was really no contract to enforce. It was kind of an open game, you know. And then the, the fact that this thing about the strike breakers being Ilocanos being brought, and my, my uncle were brought for that purpose, uh, you know, uh, it happened, and 
we just have to talk about it in a, an open way and accept what caused and what happened. Uh, by the way, the, the 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 sheriff people that got killed, they got higher compensation from from, from the plantation than, than the other. There was some monetary uh, given to families, but it was a pittance compared to what the sheriff people got. You know. Yeah. Yes, sir. My dad was one, but let me give a brief part of the journey so you understand a little bit more what it's meant to be the Sakara. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. I'm sorry, but I'm <laughs> My dad was born in the Barangay Pongyala, Santa Catalina, El Ocosor. When he was 17, he and a bunch of friends heard that there was a job offering in Hawaii. But he was too young to go. So he used his older brother's birth certificate and faked it. So he was able to sign up with his friends and they gave him a necklace with the, with the plantation name on it. So he got on a, a, from Santa Catalina, they got on trucks. And a truck to Manila. And then they got on a steamship. And they ended up first in Tokyo. And by the way, he saw the results of the big Tokyo earthquake. And then he ended up in Honolulu. And then he was assigned uh, to Opala a plantation on the big island. And that's where it is, right there. The yeah. same plantation. Right. Yeah. And when I interviewed him for this story, he said the first night, he cried, and he cried for about a week before he got back with me. It was so hard. He said he could not stand it, but he didn't make it. And I bet he did because we were born here. So the other part of the story is my uh, uncle, Domain Rexa, was the last of the plantation workers in Kauai. So my girlfriend and I, Mercy, when we were on a vacation, Bird was a rag sack there. So I looked at the phone book, and sure enough, the one and door rags. So I called him, and I had, I got a P9. So I said, um, is the one and door rag sack there? And then the back said, that's a howling guy who want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Robert Rexack. I think I'm related to Uncle Dominic. He says, oh, okay. You come see me in the house. I said, uh, okay, I'm in Lihoi. We're, we're in Lihoi. And he said, uh, okay, Uncle, uh, how do I find you? He said, oh, go up the highway. Which highway? Uh, I said, oh, is it Kuhuhi? He said, oh yeah, go up north. I said, okay, where do I go after that? He said, the party post office. The post office, okay, that should be easy. There ought to be a flag. Right? He said, okay, go up the road, go up to the road, and look for the dirt road. So after we passed the post office, here we are in the middle of a plantation. And the, the shoot cane is higher than the car. So we, there's several dirt roads, so I said, I'll pick the first one. So we went up this dirt road, it's getting narrower and narrower, and all of a sudden it opens up. And there's this shack, and I mean a shack. And you probably know what a shack is if you've been living in the Campo. So we go up to the shack, and sure enough, there's a car, and I can. I remember that because I did the compo too. You, know, you heat the wood, uh, your, the, your hot water, with the wood burning outside the house. And outside the house also was a refrigerator. And I said, this has to be, I should have taken a picture of it, but this should have been, it was the first evening of what my dad and my, of course my uncle had experienced as being a sakata. And in this case, my uncle was allowed to be on the plantation housing until he passed away. That was because he was the last of the 
in this occurrence, in this plantation. And when my girlfriend and I looked at that, I said, how do they live that way? Well, that was in 1980. How was it like in 1924 when my dad arrived and left in 1927? So when you see a picture of a Sakata, you have to put a little more empathy to it. And for those of us who ever worked on the in the fields, we know we have that, that empathy. Yeah. Thank you, Mara. Now with Daska. Maybe I should go over here so we don't have to turn around. Uh, two comments and a question. The, uh, the first comment is uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming over 2,500 miles <laughs> to, across the pond to be with us. Second comment is thank you for sharing the, the humanity side of being a Sakata because it reminded me of in the 50s the experiment workers they struck when there was inequity. In Delano, 65, they struck because there was inequity. And I guess the, uh, the humanitarian part or the question, the question is, is when the Filipinos came over to the plantations, were they considered indentured slaves? In other words, were they, they had to be there on the plantation for a year, two years, three years? Usually it's a three-year contract in the early days. Contract. And and a lot of, and you had to fulfill just how many days to make sure that you work. You know, the way you can find out if any of your, if you have Sakala roots in Hawaii, uh, type in in your uh, computer, BYU Filipino Collection. Bring home Young University, we have a, and just follow the instructions and you type your father's name, your grandfather's name and last name, and the record will pop out. But it might be, you might have to do your homework because a lot of guys use fake identities, it could have been their brother or another man's name. That they, but if you know the name that they came under, you might be able to trace it. Okay, so that's one way. But it was three years, like my grandfather came to, went to Hawaii in 1918 and fulfilled his three-year contract and then went back home and then brought his sons later on he came back again another three years and that's how it was yeah but those guys who work in a plantation they could move from plantation to plantation the plantations would just you know they they leave and then they go to another uh, plantation but of course a great majority of them never left they came to the west coast i think one third went back to the philippines maybe a third came here but the rest that's the foundation of the people in hawaii today was those who remain in Hawaii and you know that's history. Terry. Hi. Um, I through Fonz I found out that my grandfather uh, went to Hawaii in 1913. 19, for three years. One of the earlier ones, yeah. He was from the Visayas. Yes. And um, he had followed his two cousins that had gone there the year before. Mm -hmm. And also, at the same time, my grandmother, who was from Spain, her family was also, because they were, the plantations were contracting over in Spain also, they went to Hawaii at the same time. They were on the same island, but not the same plantation, and they didn't meet until Stockton in 1924. But, um, because of Fonz, I learned why everybody was in Hawaii, you know? And so, um, and I, one of the plantations, and I don't know which, if it's my grandmother's or my grandfather's, but it was on the, the, the Hue, L-I-H-U-E. Mm -hmm. So I have to figure out which one it was, but um, I, I thank you for coming here and for telling these stories, because it tells me what their lives must have been like 
Um, well, they're recruited from Spain, too, yeah. and from Portugal. Yeah. And would you believe it or not, Ukraine? Yeah. There were some that came to the islands from Ukraine. Yeah. Okay, I, I think we have room for one more question. It's not a that was my roommate in college and he was a freedom fighter and uh, hate really. Uh, they have a, a sign going around and it says Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. like they really do. And his freedom fighter just want to say thank you Erwin for inviting me and thank you folks for listening and I hope you have a better understanding of our roots 
not only in Hawaii but here on the West Coast as well. So, and by the way, next year is the 30th anniversary of the closing of the sugar plantation in my hometown, and we will be celebrating it. And you're all invited to come. It's going to be a whole week of remembering on the big island of Hawaii. And no, Honoka, where I'm from, is the only place in the territory that we are still using the same buildings that dates back to the 20s and 30s. They are still in place being used today. We're trying to, to establish uh, uh, all these buildings as historic. So if you come to Honoka, you'll see it's just a one street down, just like this, you know. All the buildings there. Mahalo. Have a big round of applause. Yeah, thank you.